Okay. Hello. Um, thank you for having me today. What a great talk. Uh, some of the previous discussions kind of uh, assist with uh, the topic that I'm going to speak about today. It's a very nice way that they've lined up the different topics. Um, so today what we're going to explore is the invisible future of design and look at how sensors and physical context awareness are transforming our approach to designing and developing digital products. Now most design processes today look something like this. You produce a set of fixed screen states or flows and you build those out over the course of development sprints and you package and ship those out into the market. And those screens will behave exactly the same way in every context in which those screens are being used. Right? Regardless of the user's physical context, those screens and flows that have been designed are going to behave pretty much the exact same way. Right? And this is how design has worked for as long as I can remember. But what this process has resulted in is a world in which we have smartphones filled with dumb apps. Right? A dumb app is an app that has no knowledge of the user's physical context or the context in which it is being used. Right? So what's an example of an, an app that doesn't have this type of intelligence? It's one that probably all of you have on your phone right now. Some of you may even be using it. Twitter. So we'll take a quick look at an example of how intelligent the Twitter app is in understanding the user's physical context. Where? What? Huh? What do I do? What? How do I explore? Where? Don't worry, mate, it's just Twitter. Hope you don't mind the company, but um, obviously I don't run. Who are you? But don't worry about that, I'm here to help you with Twitter. Listen, what I need you to do, just click on the little magnifying glass thing there, Julio. I think I can do this. Come on, let's go exploring together. Okay. Your back is very sweaty, but I'm so excited about this, I'm going to ignore that. Okay. Yeah. You're doing really well. Thanks, man. Don't just keep scrolling, it's going to be wicked. And what is this? Whoa, Candace Parker? It's the Explore tab. Listen to Candace, Explore. Dude, you're into ninjas. Yeah. That's it, keep exploring. These are things I like. I like that you like things. Keep scrolling. Okay. Julio, you just mastered Twitter. Wow, that's rad. Yeah, and they're constantly evolving and changing, just like you. And um, maybe stop saying rad, yeah? Are we good now, Julio? Yeah, I think we are. Guys, wait up. I need someone to charge this up. Does anybody have a snack or something? So that's an ad from Twitter. That's a real ad. And you notice that the user is running, and they're using all the features of Twitter. It's meant to be humorous, but it shows the limitation of the design. Right? Twitter assumes that the same interface you enjoy using while running down the street is the same interface that you would enjoy using while sitting in a cafe. And that the same interface that you would use while driving in a car is the same interface that you would enjoy using while sitting in this room. Right? It has no knowledge of the user's physical context and doesn't take that into account. And phones are so smart these days, and, and your phones know this, but most apps are quite dumb in this regard. Right? So when you think about UX, you don't start with these static screen states. You start with the physical context. So this is an image here in Istanbul. Right? And so when you look, start with the physical context in which a user may use or experience your product, you start to look at scenes like this where you have five different potential screen states. One user is exiting the train. She has earbuds in the ear. Her phone is facing away from her. She's not looking at the screen. She's moving. That's one context. Another user is below the shade. She has a battery plaque plugged into her phone. So she's sensitive about battery life. And she's in a focused screen state, actually looking at the screen. Another user is entering the train. He's likely to lose connectivity. So he's going to be offline. So all of these are potential screen states and context in which designs need to take into account. And designs should morph to fit the user's physical context. Right? And so when we start to take into account these different aspects of the physical environment in which a screen or an app or a product is being used, then we can start to build smart apps with autonomous interfaces. And an autonomous interface, similar to an autonomous car, which is self-driving, it's an interface or a product that you design that can morph automatically to fit each changing physical context. 
right? And so an app or a voice product can actually morph based on the external constraints that it's sensing using sensors, right? And so similar to how many of you are familiar with, by show of hands, what this is? Right? So this is the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And so similar to the way that when they encounter a conflict or a constraint, they morph to form a new, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a new way of, of fighting off that adversary, your interfaces should also know how to morph based on the physical context and constraints in which it's being used. And so the building blocks of building these or coming up with these smarter interfaces of the future, I. For me, from my perspective, there's three key elements to that. Voice, motion, and gestures. Those are the components upon which we're going to build these smarter interfaces of the future and for this invisible design um, element that's powered by sensors. So we'll take a look at each one of these. I know it may seem something that's very futuristic or far off, but I'm going to let you know that there's real examples here and now today, even from what we've done at TRT World. So let's take a look at voice. So voice is, is an interface where the sound of your voice or the words that you're speaking is the only UI that you need, right? So at TRT World, we have three voice-based products that we've actually developed, launched in the market. One of these, the News Quiz, which is the first one, it actually won the Actions on Google Developer Challenge last year in two categories, right? And so TRT World is listed on google.com as winning awards in these categories. And so these are three voice-based products that are available on Amazon Alexa and also uh, 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 Google Assistant. And so with these products, the, the quiz, you interact with it through the sound of your voice. It poses three questions to you with three answers, and you have to speak the name of the correct answer. The last one, Tough Choices, is a voice adventure game where it's a story of a family in Afghanistan, and that story changes based on your choices that you make navigating your way to safety. So this is voice, where the sound of your voice is the only UI that you need. The next building block is motion. Right? So how do you integrate motion into your products and into your designs? So one example is the World Wildlife Fund. So the first app that you see that has 10 miles per hour, 10 MPH, um, this one over here, that was the first time that I really started to see apps use sensors in a really smart way. So the World Wildlife Fund app has an accelerometer in it. And what it does is it challenges you to see how fast you can run compared to a Jaguar, right? And so what you do is you hit start and you physically start running as fast as you can. And then you stop and it tracks your speed and allows you to challenge a friend and see who can run the fastest compared to a Jaguar, right? So that's an invisible experience when you just hit start and you start physically running and it's using sensors to actually check that. The second screen that you see in the middle is a screen that everyone that's bought an iPhone 10 or a newer iPhone device, you've seen this screen where the, it, the screen actually prompts you and says the iPhone can detect when you may be driving and automatically silence incoming alerts and notifications. Wow, that's pretty smart, right? The last screen that you see is a screen of an app that we've developed at TRT World within our R&D team called Bloom Daily Videos. And Bloom has a similar prompt. It says, Bloom can detect when you may be walking or driving and automatically switch from video to audio. Smart. So just to take this a bit further, this is not something that's very futuristic or uh, 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 far out thinking. This is available now. So Bloom Daily Videos, we've launched that recently. It's available on the App Store. If you search it, it's only for iOS for now because it's an R&D product. But you can actually go and download this now and test it walking around this building. And you can see how it uses sensors to switch between audio and video. And so just to go a bit further on that, so the app starts out with video. It features five international news videos each day from TRT World that's produced by our team. And it's really interesting world news video from a wide range of topics. Today, there's videos featured in there about Kanye West. Um, there's uh, about uh, uh, Cuba relations between the US and Cuba. Really interesting world news video. So the app starts with video, prompts you when it knows that you're walking or driving, and then automatically switches to audio. And you can go back and forth between those different modes. So if you're still skeptical and thinking, OK, how does this really work? Here's an example of the product, di product designer from my team that actually worked on, on this one. So the app starts with video. And you pretend as if you're walking. This is how we test. 
should start shaking like yeah. gives you a prompt and switches to audio I think it's really expanding uh, the audiences and when you put the phone in the background the audio continues to play and this is just a great example not even YouTube can do this today right so YouTube if you want to watch it, if you want to listen to the audio of a YouTube or Facebook or Twitter video, you have to be careful when you put the phone in your pocket so that you don't touch the screen, right? Our app is smart enough to do that. When we produce videos, in order to make this experience work, we now have to produce a dedicated MP3 file for every video that we have to allow the app to switch automatically between those two modes. Right? So the last uh, building block of how you build these smarter interfaces is using gestures, where your fingers are the only interface that you need. And so this is a really interesting project from Google called Project Soli. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of this before, uh, but it's, an, it's a, a really interesting concept that's using gestures. So let's take a look at Project Soli from Google. Now we're at a point where we have the hardware where we can sense these interactions and we can put them to work. We can explore how well they work and how well they might work in products. So that's project solely from Google, right? Where your fingers are the only interface that you need. And so when we start to think about these elements and, you know, how do we bring the magic back into the products that we've designed, right? At some point, apps used to feel magical. When you bought a new phone and you launched an app for the first time, it, it felt magical. It was almost as if it could anticipate what you wanted, right? And so how do you bring the magic back? You know, combining these more advanced features around sensors, voice, motion, gestures, and when you combine that with what I call invisible breakpoints, that's how you start to build more powerful interfaces. And that's how you start to anticipate and bring magic back to the products that we develop, right? So what are invisible breakpoints? We're all familiar with the concept of a breakpoint, right? That's how an interface morphs based on the screen size that's available for that particular design, right? What about breakpoints in life? So invisible breakpoints are the breakpoints that you encounter in your day-to-day -day life. When you saw the picture of the people exiting the train, right? Those are breakpoints. When I go from walking to driving, when I go from my Wi-Fi connected home and I exit and I enter a 3G connection, when I go into a train and I have no connection, these are breakpoints in life that people encounter on a daily basis. But for the most part, designers haven't started to incorporate that into the way that we design products, right? And so one of the things, you know, one of the last points I want to leave you with, because I want to see if there's enough room for questions, is responsible design, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm using terms that may be familiar to you, but in a different type of context, right? Invisible breakpoints, you're familiar with breakpoints, you're familiar with responsive design, but responsible design is about being responsible with the data that users give you access to. So there's a quote from the Spider-Man movie that, with great power comes great responsibility. So you have access to a wide range of sensors in these devices, but you have to be responsible and not abuse that. Users are giving you access to fitness and motion tracking, to front-facing cameras, to location. All of these things, you have to be responsible and not abuse that power that users are giving you to give them a more personal experience. Not only that, you have to be responsible in terms of the data and the battery life that your product consumes. Right? Video is very battery heavy. If you're watching a lot of YouTube videos, if you have kids and they watch a lot of videos, it completely drains the battery. Right? But with Bloom Daily videos, as you see in this screenshot, when the app detects that you're moving too fast to be looking at the screen, it switches into an audio mode. Right? So that's lower bandwidth, lower battery life. That's a more responsible way of designing products. And that's the last point I wanted to leave you with. Um, like I say, all of these examples are live. A lot of other work that we're doing around sensors at TRT World. We have VR um, apps as well that are using sensors for motion and so forth. Um, all of this is available at trtworld.com slash connect. Um, and that's where you can see the latest products that we've designed and, and, and developed within my team. Okay. Is there time for, okay. Uh, I can take any questions people may have. Any questions? None? <laughs> so, you have been talking about responsible design. What do you do as a company to guide the designers and force them to be responsible designers? 
Yeah, so like I mentioned, the, the, it's having empathy for users. And so us being an international uh, news organization, we cater to audiences that are in countries that may not have unlimited bandwidth, right? And so one of those things I mentioned is being able to give users an audio only, a low bandwidth audio only version of a video, right? That they can still consume the content, but it's not gonna consume all of that battery life. And then in terms of how we design the products, we take a lot of care in the prompts that we present users before we actually have them opt in. So Bloom requires you to opt in to motion tracking. And we did user testing on that just to see what, do people actually, are they receptive to that? Do they feel that that's a privacy valuation? Do they find that valuable or useful? And so we base that on user feedback. So we design screens that prompt users saying, hey, we would like to get access to fitness and tracking and so that we can get, you know, we can automatically switch into audio. So we did user testing on that, specifically probing users on do they find that useful, valuable, and, you know, maybe one out of the X number of users that we tested said, hey, I don't really trust that. You know, that's not compelling enough for me to give you access to my fitness tracking. But this is something that we do based on user research and it's also a design consideration. When you're designing those screens, making sure that it's done in a way where it feels trusting. Okay. All right. Any more? One more question? Okay, so everyone is gonna go and start designing products based around sensors. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you.